I'll just make sure that Wonderful. So let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Matthew from Impact Innovation Group, and we're working with the Queensland Government to deliver a series of webinars on behalf of the Office of Small Business. Today's webinar topic is Handling Uncertainty in Small Business with our guest presenter, Trey Ann Stedden from Dental Care Extra and Murumba Traders. Just while we're waiting for other people to connect into the webinar, I'll go through some of the tools we'll be using for those people who haven't used a webinar with the Citrix GoTo webinar systems before. Your screen should look like this, a slide in the center and a control panel or dashboard on your right. This control panel will collapse automatically when you're not using it. So to keep it open, just click the view menu at the top and uncheck auto hide control panel. Asking questions. During the webinar, we might ask you a question or two so we can better understand your experience with the topic. We will ask you to raise your hand and to do that, just click on the little hand icon on the side of the control panel. Remember to lower your hand afterwards just by clicking the icon again. There is also an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the webinar. So we can ensure that the webinar flows smoothly and we stick to the allocated time, we will be fielding a Q &A session of questions and answers, I should say, at the end of the webinar for about 10 to 15 minutes. So as well as that, we can also let, use this function to let us know if you're having any connection problems or broadcast issues. Just as a test, can everyone click on the blue icon to raise their hand? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. We have, sorry, we have also um, have some handouts for you, which you can access and download by clicking on this section here. Train has kindly agreed to share his slide deck with us, and you, it's where you can access it. Now, please don't forget to download these documents as they've been specifically prepared for you to help you understand the web, today's webinar. They will not be available to download after the completion of the webinar, so I'll remind you again just before the webinar ends. There will, the, this webinar will also be recorded for uh, and will be uploaded onto YouTube to watch at a later date. So now it's time to bring on our, our presenter for today. Tran is passionate about delivering a range of quality outcomes that meet a range of internal and external customer requirements. His strategic focus that allows him to bring together processes, people, and technology to deliver results that make a difference. He is an experienced marketer and, extensive, and has extensive experience across sales, service, and with a clear focus on optimizing total channel mix. Tran is the director and owner of an independently owned and locally owned operated uh, quality dental service in the Isaac and McKay region of central Queensland. He, jointly was, he was jointly responsible for the establishment from the ground up of dent, uh, four dental practices in Murrumbah in 2013. Welcome to the webinar, Tran. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Trian Stinton, and um, I'm very pleased to have you join uh, me here this afternoon on this great day up in Mackay um, to talk about innovation and um, hopefully give you some tips and pointers around how to harness innovation and use it to the best of your, your business ability um, with a few reality checks that hopefully you can learn from my mistakes or uh, learnings that I've taken during this process of building uh, a practice over the last five years. So as I say, my name's Trian. We have two brands um, that we have developed here in the Mackay and Isaac region, the first of which is Dental Care Extra, an independently owned uh, dental practice um, that we have built three locations at where quality and care 
ready management patients. And um, uh, most lately, in December last year, we opened a new brand called Kits, which is more of a, a pediatric child-centered uh, environment for children um, from the age of zero to approximately 10 years, where we can take a total health focus uh, for the child and the family themselves. So it's quite a marked departure from our existing dental uh, offering services, as we offer GP, uh, speech therapists, chiropractors, like patient consultants, um, all to help the parents get the best outcome for long term for their children. So the, the question I'm going to pose to you, and um, I'll come discuss some ideas I have, is how do you turn uh, an idea into income? And really, what would stop you from turning that idea into income? I guess for me, um, as a business owner and a marketer, um, we all have lots of great ideas all the time. Um, and to be honest, there are no new ideas. They're only reskinned, stolen from somebody else, or delivered from somebody else, or or just created. So whatever you can kind of think up, I am I'm pretty sure that you actually find that idea has been trial, tested, or may even be implemented at this stage. So what stops you from de developing those ideas is is, is um, the ability, time, uh, effort, focus, um, the reality that the timing for the for the marketplace might not be right. It may be capital resources that you have, and also a major problem we're kind of facing in now here already here in, in the Mackay Isaac region is skills. Um, all these things kind of have to be taken into consideration when you want to turn an idea into income. So what are the elements that you need to deliver to turn that idea? And I'm going to talk on the subject today around a number of items relating to marketing and sales, customer needs, leadership, people and staff, time management, and managing growth. All these are, are critical elements that you kind of need to factor into with an idea um, and make sure that you have um, the ability to um, deliver against that expectation of what that idea is. Having um, the ability to manage these is very challenging at the best of times. Uh, particularly around the HR component can be very challenging if you are developing a new idea and trying to get people on board to actually understand the value of what you're delivering and um, get them to buy into the vision itself. Marketing and sales is a really interesting part of it and, and a lot of it is actually in the proposition correct so that you know what you're actually delivering or what your idea is delivers against the customer need. There's no point in creating a product or service unless it's going to be a specific need and you understand what that need is and what the triggers are to do that. Customer needs, do you all kind of know what your customer needs are and how you can actually harness those? There may be uh, customer needs that are latent, that are there already, or actually there may be needs that haven't been thought of about from your customers that actually need to be developed and grown. To do that, leadership's also important. So if you have an idea or concept, it's very important to actually be able to articulate that to your stakeholders, to your team members, to your fellow colleagues, to the wider community, so they understand the value of what you're delivering it. Now, um, I've always found that the, the simpler things are, the harder they are to get to that point. Um, and this is the really hard part about narrowing down your idea to be able to articulate it as clearly as you possibly can. For us, the example is where we focus on for our dental component. We provide a, a, an oasis of care where quality really matters. Um, now, I'm not a dentist or a clinician, and when I set up this business, it, to be honest, it doesn't really matter too much. What I was aware of is what the client need was, uh, where we need to take the business, and what service we were delivering to that. And from that, the proposition was quite clear what we're going to deliver. Then we wrap around care around everything that we do. For time management, any of the stuff that you want to try and do in an innovative kind of space, time management is critical. Um, you can spend a lot of time going down a lot of rabbit warrens trying to discover what's an opportunity or not. I find that um, you probably need to stress test a lot of your ideas with friends, with your customers, um, and see whether it resonates. Does that kind of make sense? Do they kind of get the idea straight away, or does it need further refinement, or maybe you need to come up with a new idea? Uh, uh, the last challenge I kind of want to talk about is managing growth, and managing growth is a really critical part of innovation. Um, we moved from one practice to two practices, and at that stage, the 
most important thing that I recognised from moving to one to two outlets was the standardisation of our systems and processes. Can't stress enough in terms of being able to know exactly what your standard processes are in terms of front office, back office, in in room processes, and have those documented, and making sure that the staff will understand that, and then how they roll out. If you don't kind of do that and have the measurements in place, you're really flying blind a lot of the time, and are not quite sure whether you're hitting the mark or not. So managing growth for yourself and the business is very critical. Where do you get your ideas from? It's a it's a really good question, and, and um, I'm in the dental industry or the health industry, but I really don't get my ideas from the health or dental industry. I, I benchmark my service experience or the, or the care that we deliver based on all the experiences that I have throughout an entire year or an entire journey of experiencing them. So when I talk to my staff about what our competition is, I don't really consider it other dentists. I say, well, what's the experience that you have when you fly? And what, how they greet you when, when they welcome you on board. If I'm ringing American Express call centre, but I have a card issue, what's the experience I get from them? What's the local experience I get from a retailer here in Mackay that's really good service? Because when we think about our customers, they're not ju judging us on our, our industry type, and well, if I go and visit a dentist, I should only experience this type of care or attention. They are judging your service on based on the whole entire experience that they're actually delivering. So I invite you, and want you to stress test your own business about what kind of service are you actually delivering and where do you get your ideas to deliver that. And maybe globally, you might be searching globally for offshore companies, you might have had a great online experience, you might have a great telephony experience. That's where I kind of get my ideas from in terms of implementation and then think about how I can convert it back to my business. What, what do you do with that idea? As I said before, there's kind of a lot of ideas out there, and I would probably start with Google first and actually exploring who has created that idea that you have already. As I said, a lot of ideas have been created already, and so I'd recommend that you go online, search out who might be doing something similar, have a conversation with them, do some market intelligence, uh, find out from their customers how their experience is, um, does there seem to be a real gap in the marketplace that needs to be fulfilled, or is there another opportunity to kind of optimise that experience itself. Um, sometimes ideas can take a long time to evolve. So you might be sitting on an idea or had an idea or a light bulb moment maybe two years ago and it takes time for you to process what that actually means. Other times if you know your business well intuitively you'll get that idea and you'll be able to implement it straight away. So I don't think there's any rules or expectations around where an idea should come from and how you implement it. I guess the thing is that you need to test it, get in there and try it and see how it's going to work to minimum cost to you but maximum gaining of information. So what are you responsible for as the business owner in terms of this idea? So a lot of the time is actually once you've formulated this idea or, or got the idea, you've stress tested it, you've kind of seen where it's going, how does this fit with your wider business? It's really important when you're looking at an idea, does it, is it a complementary service that you're offering? Is it an alternative service that you're offering? Is it a product extension? Is it something that's really different to what you're doing? And I think that's really important that you then assess that back against your own business. And does this idea or concept meet your strategy? Because if you're going to kind of do something really different, you're going to have to make a conscious decision about whether this is going to be the right thing for you short term and long term for your business. In our circumstance, we're located, we have first practices in Moranbar where we've had a, uh, a mining downturn. Um, so we had to look at kind of extending our services out across the region. Now, in the dental industry, it's very competitive. Uh, there's a lot of health funds that are coming into the industry and a lot of dentists. So they're all kind of fighting in the same kind of area. We decided that we didn't want to do that and we, were gonna, we weren't focusing on the price element of what we're delivering never mind that we're actually kind of being able to deliver the quality that we need to do, but also that we were actually able to deliver the quality that we want back for a wider scope of services. Fortunately, we, with our service offering, we've looked at doing stuff that nobody else does in the region um, and being able to offer that here in a unique proposition. And that's probably where kids came around, is that we determined and looked in their marketplace and said, well, there's an opportunity here to provide a service for children, and this is kind of where we see this sitting in the marketplace, here's our target market, here's a proposition for those particular services, and what are the channels we're going to do. 
to do. So a lot of that was up to me in terms of having the vision in my head, being able to articulate it to people, to draw it, to pitch it, to paint it, um, and then be able to start delivering it. And that was delivered with a new practice here in December 2016. How do I manage that rollout? So when I'm developing a new product or service, I really have to consider three elements, people, process, and technology. All of these have to work in line with the strategy, and all these have to be enabled in a manner that can be delivered in a timely fashion. Now, in terms of people, have, have we got the right people on the ground that can kind of do this, have the capability, have the training, have the willingness, energy, and expertise to do this type of work? If we don't, where can we kind of get these people from to help us? Um, and how do we source them and keep them? Very, very important. Um, particularly for us, we're in the health industry, so it's important that we have a, a degree of care and commitment uh, and professionalism in everything that we do. For processes, I can't stress heavily enough around process. Uh, when we opened up our new practice, kids here in Mackay, uh, we have three service offerings, but I wasn't prepared to open them all up at once. We had to go through phases of opening one process up at a time and letting the team bed down in that process. How does it work? What timers do we need to have? Uh, who needs to do what and what sequence? And refining that process. Not until the team were comfortable, they had in a comfortable position where they were able to move forward and take more capacity on, then, then, then did I actually start to start to do some marketing to actually attract more patients to that service. Um, the sequence Thing and the timing is, I cannot stress, so important if you're bringing on a range of services, whether it's a restaurant, uh, we're adding in new food lines, or you've got some new technology that's coming on site, make sure that your staff understand the sequencing and the timing of those, and you're fully aware of where the pit holes and problems are going to be. And technology, if anything's going to ever let you down, it's going to be technology, um, and it's going to happen at the worst possible time, so make sure that you've got a robust technology platform. Um, I kind of think now anybody that goes into business really needs to have some sort of IT background um, because of the way that technology is integrating now and cloud-based services, you really have to have a handle on where the opportunities are. Technology for me enables two kind of things. One, driving a great patient experience through visualization, through the way in which we handle inquiries. And to that end, we are now developing a customer relationship management tool we're probably one of the first dentists in Australia to use this technology to enable us to communicate and manage our patients. And the second bit of technology is around process improvement. Um, technology can either be an enabler or a disabler. It uh, depends on the type of technology that you have and the way in which you're using it. Select your, very, your technology very carefully. Look at its integration points. Does it have an API? Can I feed data in and out of it? How flexible is it? Uh, is it based onshore or offshore? And if it's onshore, have you got the local support that you need for technology? Very, very critical part of any business moving forward. And it's a big investment that needs to be taken into consideration, not only the technology itself, but also the insurances that you need to have in place in terms of covering things when they go wrong. How do you know that you're successful? Goals, measures, and reporting. So I guess, um, you probably don't want to do anything until you know that you can actually get an outcome from it. So why bother investing time, money, staff in something without having some measures around it? Um, if you get to know your business a bit better, you intuitively probably know around the numbers and, and what you might hit. Um, and sometimes you need to stress test that. So previously I've used a mentor um, and have the mentor entering for growth program, which was an excellent way of me being able to validate my ideas and concepts with somebody that is not part of the business but has a business acumen that can assist you. I can't stress how important that is as well, because at times when you're working in your own business, uh, you tend to come relatively insular and it's hard to see the tree for the woods. So I, I would recommend that you kind of help somebody validate your ideas and also help you work out some measures. So goals, measures and reporting. I think if you're going to implement new things, you need to have a quick method of getting feedback, and you need to be able to get it quickly from staff, from customers. Uh, we implement it here every day that we have a patient here. We're doing a surveying every patient. So if there is a problem occurring, that we can jump on it relatively quickly and address that problem. Now, problems are always going to occur. It's about how you deal with that problem and jump on it as quick as you can to get a resolution for the patient.
Um, so focus on what you can do. And reporting is a really critical bit. I mean, I've been working on reporting for five years now, and it's still not the area that I really want it to be. I'm just completing a new project now to try and do cost up reporting, which will allow me to look at point of sale or sales on a daily basis and then determine my profitability. That will then help me determine my marketing spend because I'll know what the profitability of the product is and what I need to push. So make sure you've got enough open data that allows you to get this core information that you need to do about being successful in your business, which reporting will allow you to do. What happens if it's not working? Uh, it's a really good question and, and um, at times you need to be able to uh, be able to either kill it really quickly or stick with it or modify it. And, and that's a really hard call and there's no, there's no set answers to what you should do. What the reporting and measure should do is give you some indication of whether it's successful or not, whether there's market penetration. For our new, new operation kids in Mackay, I was very uncertain about the way in which I should market this product. Um, we started advertising in November the last year and with some television commercials and they really weren't hurt, hurt, um, hitting the mark. We then refined radio commercials and that still wasn't hitting the mark. Um, I then talked to the team and, and kind of get some ideas around what some of the what patients were saying to us in terms of what type of treatment they wanted and where, where we what messaging they were telling us about why they came to see us. From that I was then able to develop a proposition around two elements of the fact that people don't need to wait to have braces can get a second opinion from us and that they can get a second opinion from us. So we modified our radio, I changed our FDM and SEO activity and have been changing the uh, hard copy material that goes out to patients to enforce that messaging itself and it's kind of working now as well. Um, so look at what you're doing. If it's not working, um, look at ways in which you can maybe adapt it. Is there a product extension you can put on there? Can you couple it with another product? Can you get rid of that product and replace it with something else? Refining the product is really important as well. So once you've got a successful product, how do you make it more efficient? How do you make it more efficient in terms of the patient experience that you're delivering? How do you make it more efficient in terms of the processes that, that support it? And how do you make it more cost efficient in terms of getting the maximum profitability you can out of that product? Some stages you might actually think the market's not mature enough to deal with this product. So in that which case you may retreat. You might say, well the feedback I'm getting is it seems very challenging, people don't kind of know what I'm talking about, I seem to be spending a lot of money and time educating people, maybe I need to leave it or tackle it in a different way. For us there's different referral channels that we can push uh, information to, so it might be GPs or allied health providers where we can try and inform them that they can then inform the consumers around the opportunities as well. As well, So think about the different ways in which you can maybe backfill information. One, one, thing I, one, one really key thing I've learned over time, and I use it when I think about my marketing, is there's a rule around where people's ability to take on information and use it is. So um, I've got this percentage, 3%, 17%, and 80%. 3% of all my customers are in the market or patients are in the market at that time looking for a product or service. So 3% of them maybe have an emergency, know that they need to get a filling. So they're actively searching and where they're searching is uh, SEO or on your web website or maybe on Facebook for some information or talking to friends. 17% of my customer base or potential customer base know that they need a service or need something but they haven't turned that into actions. So they may know that they need to have their regular cleans or they know they need to have a filling but they haven't quite got around to doing it. And those are the people that you need to then switch to the conversions and all the messages for that. The, 20, the 80 percent that are left are the people that aren't aware that they have a need and that they need to then address it. So what, what your marketing and activity needs to do is raise it from the subconscious to the conscious. An example of that is when we offer my brace service here, we're accredited, the only certified practice in central Queensland offers that. And a key characteristic of our service is children that are mouth breathers. A child that are mouth mouth breather has long term health implications, not only just on their oral formation, but also in terms of their heart, um, sleeping patterns uh, and, and le levels of energy. What we've had to do is a whole stream of work, we're still working through around asking and valid checking with parents that they actually check 
that their kids are not mouth breathers and looking for the symptoms that indicate that they are a mouth breather and then make them aware of the issues that uh, require for that uh, implications of our, our mouth breathing and then what actions they do need to do to correct it. So we're kind of working on the 80% of the market who may not be aware of the fact that mouth breathing is an issue for their children and then stepping them through to the 17% where they now are consciously aware of it and now we need to prompt them to doing something to move into the 3%. So always kind of think up that scale in terms of when I'm delivering a products or services and which part of the market, how mature are they, how informed are they and therefore what messaging and where do I put that message. Um, if it's not working, take the learnings from it and keep um, That's why reporting is really important so you kind of know what your business is doing and from that point you can then work out what you need to do or don't need to do in terms of delivering the best outcomes for that. So if you've got an issue not working, kill that product, move on. You don't want to waste money on it or time. Look at what for the next innovation will be or maybe you're going to hold off for a while. Don't be afraid to do that. It's not a matter of you not, not being successful, it's a matter of recognising that that won't work as early as you can and being successful by admitting it and moving on with it. People and staffing is, is always a challenge for us running businesses and um, the challenge is, is about how you empower your staff to almost take ownership and make the decisions for themselves I guess is what we're trying to do at the end of the day. As much as we can, um, I try and encourage our staff to understand what the vision for the business is, see the important role that they're playing delivery bring that vision and then the letting them get on and do it. Um, for us in the healthcare industry and we, we deliver some fantastic outcomes for our patients, that's where we have to kind of keep on focusing on is those outcomes of what we deliver to our back to our customers or our patients. Uh, for our team they acknowledge that and that that's kind of what drives them along. The challenge is keep when you've got staff turnover or you bring new staff on board is getting them up to speed, making sure that they're consistent in the way they do that, and um, which is really through training and recruiting. Recruitment. I kind, of, I kind of guess we get a lot of our staff actually coming through as patients who kind of see the work that we do and kind of want to be part of it. So we're kind of lucky in that respect. Um, but for trying to recruit people, it's very challenging, and and I and I and I only recommend that you have a very structured way in which you do the recruitment and onboarding, which includes guidelines, your policies, and procedures. That's very clear up front. Uh, the risks of not doing this in terms of your reputation and also legally significant, um, so I've actually outsourced some of my HR component uh, to an organisation that will indemnify me to help me manage it, um, which is really great and they're taking a lot of pressure off me um, and know that I have expert advice whenever I need to get it. Um, and pragmatic, I guess um, as, you, as you grow into the business uh, and <laughs> you take on the stress of running a business, which it is stressful, um, you have to be more pragmatic about things and, and try and work out what you actually need to do and how you manage stuff. Um, don't take stuff to heart. Um, from my perspective, we, we, I'm running a business and that's the way I'm, I think about it. Um, and I don't like to take it personally and, and if somebody tells me my idea is rubbish or, or there's a better concept of how something should be done, I'm not going to take that personally as well. I think it's an opportunity that somebody's had the guts to give me some feedback and then I reflect on that and see if it is a great opportunity. So open heart, it's kind of pragmatic and open hearted to these problems that come your way. Um, there's always opportunities and there's always a destiny I believe so things happen for a particular reason. Um, kind of go with that a little, little bit and, and just be open to opportunities and, and what potential solutions are. Um, time management keeping sane probably relates back to the last one. If you're a business owner you're trying to juggle things and you've got a family and all sorts of things, how do you balance all that kind of line? So for me it's really important that we kind of focus on keeping the balance, having some of your own time, get away from work, uh, do you know what, it will still continue if you're not there for a couple of days, life will continue and go on, uh, but you need to give yourself, yourself some time and space, which then allows you to be more innovative and creative in the long run. If you're kind of bound up too much in the job, and it's dragging you down too much, you find your innovative and creativeness will leave. A couple of weeks ago I was having a kind of hard time and um, I forced myself to have one hour of creativity and I basically just went on to uh, Shutterstock and created a couple of ads that were just, from my viewpoint, were excellent. <laughs> I don't know what everybody else thought, but I quite like them. Um, but it, what that gave me was an hour of creativity that I found that I could vent back out that area after being so process-driven all the time. But I can come back to that and know that you know, I can still 
will deliver the stuff that I need to in a creative fashion. Okay. Um, uh, just wrapping up now, I'm conscious of time. Um, I, I always talk to talk to people about this one, particularly staff and my team about things. Um, you only become a good sailor if you travel in rough waters. Uh, um, and, and things are tough. Um, innovation and creativity is not a, is not a easy road to go down. You have a lot of people doubting you all the time. People pouring cold water on you. Um, but re really, the reality is that you know if you don't try and go through hard times, take those learnings from it. Um, you become a lot better, more resilient as you move forward in the business. I mean, what kind of alternative do you have, have if you're running your own business and looking innovative, creatively? You can kind of just curl up on a ball and kind of ignore it, or you can take it as a challenge, regroup, move on, and look for some other creative, innovative solutions to keep you moving forward. As soon as you lose that passion, I think you need to look at different ways of managing it and, and kind of getting rid of that, those problems that you're having. So that's my suggestion: is you know, you've all found hard times, dig deep, be resilient, have a break, and don't be so hard on yourself. Um, and, and wrapping up, don't be afraid to innovate for growth. Um, always look for opportunities for changing stuff. Always question things, question staff, question yourself. Um, look for those where, where shining examples of great innovation happen, and it may not be related to your business or what you're doing, but I recommend just get out there um, and, and innovate for growth for the future. I'm now going to um, open up for any questions that anybody has. You're welcome to ask me anything at all. I think anything's all good, um, and hopefully I can answer those for you. Thank you so much for that, Trey, and for sharing everything today. It was great to hear such relatable and kind of interesting examples and opportunities that we can all take, take advantage of moving forward. Um, now, we do have a few questions uh, from a number of people. So uh, if any of the questions that come to you, please feel free to type them in. But uh, we'll start with this one. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge you find to reaching your target market? Um, is this a really great question. I think in terms of reaching your target market, as I kind of mentioned before, is understanding the customer need. Being very familiar with what that need is and how how you're going to kind of articulate it. Is it need around convenience, speed, price? Don't always jump to price. A lot of people jump to price and they uh, it's an easy route to take, particularly from a sales perspective that you can be the fastest to the bottom. Focus on the elements, what a customer need is, test it with them, get lots of feedback and then grow from that point onwards. So focus on your customer need, what are they wanting, how does your product and service match against that need, make sure that the team are familiar with how that works and then sell it in and then monitor it and adjust it. Excellent. I guess it's it's making sure getting that balance right between monitoring and kind of execution. Um, another question here, uh, how do you go about getting customer feedback or insight to ensure you're on track with your ideas? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question as well. Thank you for that one. Um, getting feedback is really critical and um, there are a number of ways that you can do it. Um, I, I, I'm surveying every patient that comes to visit us. We do a survey that goes out, and um, that captures instant problems that we may be having. We'll do an app counter one as well um, to make sure we're identifying things. Um, and then we're also welcoming it. We um, do community-based events as well, so at that I'm always looking for feedback from people about our service. Uh, ask them how it's going. Is there a problem? Um, and see if you can quantify that as well. So any measures. Now, I've been doing surveying for four years, so I've got a, three indicators that I use for or faction of 11 that I measure on. One is patients being on time in the chair. Another one is overall satisfaction out of five and then likelihood to recommend. So when I'm talking to my team about this, we're always talking about those three elements on a monthly basis because I know if any of those three elements are out, it's going to be impacting our patient satisfaction. Awesome. Um, another one here. How can you get your team the journey or what the big picture is? Um, so I think the question is a cutting out a bit. Um, how do you get your team on the journey of what the big picture is? That's, um, that's a really good question as well. Um, I think you have to kind of be able to uh, simplify the proposition about what that journey means. Um, for us, it was around quality and care for our patients in a, in a local service 
that's a wide scope that means that patients don't need to travel, that we can look after them all in the one spot with the quality and care fair professionalism that we deliver. Um, and then we show and give examples of the team of what that means. So we act professionally, we have a contemporary practice that looks modern, and we are, have a complete service offering. So we kind of articulate all three of those elements to show them what it kind of means and how that is, and then how we articulate that in terms of the service that we deliver. Um, I, I always kind of talk about the brand itself and dental care extra brand. I say, you know, dental is what we do as a functional part of the business. Care is what we wrap around everything. And the extra, or the dental care extra, is the things that we do that patients don't expect us that we do. So we're available 24 7. We have a, a therapy dog, Dexter, who will make the kids nice and relaxed. Um, we'll give them TLC calls. We'll give them hot towels. So it's all those kind of things then uh, articulate and, and show the team how their role fits in supporting that business direction and goals. And when you bring on new services and you position it as part of that strategy about where you're taking them, and then they can see how it fits together so it um, adds to the proposition for our patients. Sure. Um, just another question here. Uh, in terms of actually executing a, an innovation strategy, um, at what point do you determine that the innovation is not working and you need to try something else? Like, How far do you have to try until you go you cut your losses and move on? A uh, very good question. I kind of don't have a golden bullet answer to that one, unfortunately. I kind of think you have to look at a couple of metrics. One is the financials and, and whether you're prepared to throw a lot more money at it a lot longer. What, what's How how long you're prepared to throw money at it and, and what, is it, what does that mean to the rest of the business? If you do that, will it draw the rest of it down, which you might not want to risk that. Um, how confident are you that it's just a matter of time before this product or service takes off? Um, or is it around of education and market maturity. If it's market maturity, it's very challenging to be able to um, uh, determine what you're prepared to put in, into that to try and make it work. Um, you may want to refocus the segment that you're working on. So part of it, if it's not working, you're too broad, or the segment of the target market you're after is not the right one, try a couple of different segments and try diff the messaging is different. If you still have faith in the product, I kind of would persevere a bit longer but look at how you can maybe offset the cost if there is a cost associated with that one, or maybe maybe you might want to partner with somebody else to innovate or, or, or join forces with somebody to deliver that product in a different way. Okay. Um, another question here, how do you determine your minimum startup budget in terms of infrastructure? Sorry, the minimum what budget was that, sorry? How do you determine your minimum startup budget? Oh, shush. How do I determine a minimum startup budget? Um, okay, good question. You guys have got some great questions out there. You're way smarter than I am. Um, I kind of, when I do a startup budget, I need to look at a 12 month projection um, out of what I'm looking for. So I use a tool called lifeplan.com. This is a wonderful online tool that helps me do my business plan. And in that, we'll forecast out my capital costs, my staffing costs, my resourcing costs, and then I need to work out what my financing will be to support that. How much money am I going to chuck into it myself? How much finance can I get? I kind of guess if you know the product well or you've got a familiar with the marketplace, you can probably have an educated guess. In that case, if you do, I'd get a mentor or somebody else that's kind of been in the business area and has a sense, can validate those numbers for you, because at best, it's a best guess at, at that time, look for industry colleague, colleagues that you trust that can maybe help you and validate that that's the right kind of cost that you're putting in place. Um, and, and then maybe add some margin onto that because things always blow out and the shape always kind of goes a bit weird on you as you build out your business. So you kind of have to have some contingency in place. Um, and then maybe also work out what you want revenue. So I, I kind of knew when I built our kids what I, I needed to hit revenue in year one um, and what that meant over time. Now I'm tracking behind that at the moment, but I know that I'm going to get there. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit longer than what I expected, but I expect to get it where I want to get it within two years. And and after being in the business, in this business for kids for six months, I'm, I'm kind of recognising that it is a two-year project to actually get it into the shape that I need it to, that I'm going to be hitting what my estimates were. So um, get all your numbers out on the table, validate them with somebody else, see what the industry is doing, 
uh, road test it and, and then kind of get into it. It's kind of my thing. But, but have, have stay, do it in stages. So if it's not going to kind of work, that you haven't committed all your money, all your energy into it, and you can pull back if you need to. Uh, sorry, Trian, uh, just a follow up question on that. Uh, what was the online platform that you mentioned? Um, uh, live, liveplan.com. Liveplan. It's a subscription based, uh, yeah, liveplan.com subscription based. It helps you determine the strategy. It just ask you a series of really cool questions. It will pull a, um, a one page marketing page either for you that you can use for investors or the bank and then it will help you do our, all the forecasting for your budgets, um, your, your expenses and your revenue as well all into one spot and then you can push print and it prints a beautiful little document for you that's a kind of a, a little bible that you can kind of walk around with and, and talk to people about what your business is. Awesome. Um, one final question just because we are kind of running out of time. Um, how much, uh, how much of your budget should you allocate for innovation, and does that change depending on your size or industry? Mm, you guys are very smart. Uh, um, well, I kind of work to an overall marketing budget that I work on percentage of gross. Um, in there is is my innovation. I don't have a specific innovation budget itself. I kind of. Uh, would wrap that up in terms of a marketing kind of activity in my mind. So if I'm going to develop a product or service, I might wrap a budget against it and say this is kind of what I want to put into it. If, if there's R&D in place that you need to do, I think that's kind of a different kettle of fish where you need to go and build that out as part of your marketing plan. But um, yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to say. I, I, I work on my overall, which is about 5% of gross, is what I'm working on. My marketing budget is what it's going to come out of. Unless I can steal it from somebody else, or somebody else will give me some money, you know, I'll take more if I can. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, one last question now. Where has the best innovative idea come from dental extra, uh, dental care extra? So is it like so a, have, is it what half, member? half member or external or internal kind of sources of innovation? Where's the, where's the innovation come from? Was that the question? Sorry. Uh, where was the best idea, innovative idea come from for, for your dental care uh, extra oh. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, oh, it's kind of a mixture of all sorts of places. I think, actually, it came from my customers. Um, uh, last year, we, we, actually the year before last, we had a picture on Facebook which had a dog lying, a golden retriever lying in a chair on a patient. And I put it on Facebook. Oh, this looks a really nice kind of idea. And, I was, and it went off on Facebook in our community site. And it really resonated with everybody. And they're like, wow, that's a great idea. I'd love to go to the dentist if there's a dog there. I was like, oh, maybe there's an opportunity here. So I kind of, for the next six months, worked up an idea around having Dexter, the therapy dog, come and join us. So six months later, we'd gone through a whole process of engaging the community. What sort of dog do they want? What color do they want? Uh, what breed? do they want, so we kind of narrow all that down, then what name do you want to call the dog? And um, so six months later we ended up with a dog and um, it's probably the most innovative thing we've kind of done and we're, we're the only dental practice in Australia to bring officially a, 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 a therapy dog onto the site and the kids love them, they love them. The innovation is that the kids come to see Dexter, so they don't really come to see the dentist. They just decide <laughs> that they're going to have to go and sit in the chair for them. <laughs> They just come and, and Dexter will go and give them a lick and um, brush his teeth. So. Innovative stuff comes from all over, but that was kind of a really innovative one. And the other most innovative thing I came up with, I'll take credit on this one, is giving slippers to our patients. So they're my best marketing investment, $5,000, and I've got 5,000 slippers, and we go to social events and hand out slippers for women that get drunk at parties, at social parties, because their shoes are so uncomfortable. So, um, you know, that was a really innovative idea, and I still use it all the time now, and people re remember us for our slippers. You go. Excellent. Well, we'll have to end it there. So, uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. And remember to download the handouts before you exit. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Impact Innovation Group YouTube page should you wish to view it again. Um, you will receive a follow up email just uh, informing you of different uh, services and uh, opportunities available as part of the Office of Small Business. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, please give me an email back on the uh, email that you received your initial webinar link to. 
Thank you everyone for tuning in today and have a great day. And thank you again, Trian, for all of your insights on how to be innovative in a small business. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great one, guys.